So hi everyone, welcome to the first uh, student and graduate SMA Q&A, which is um, a chance to ask an ASM. So we've got our lovely panel of ASMs uh, waiting to take your questions. Uh, I'm Charlotte and uh, one of the hosts, the other host is Bill, who's giving you a wave. Um, uh, to start, we'll go with uh, the house rules. So um, uh, mic's off, uh, but camera's on is okay. If you wish, if you want to turn your camera off, that's fine as well. Um, uh, and any questions, uh, send them to um, Martin, who's, uh, if you click on the chat and then click on questions to the panel, Martin's on that. Um, and you can send all your questions to Martin. Um, we'll be alternating who's asking the questions and who's checking the chat for questions um, throughout. So uh, if you send them all to, Mar uh, to the questions to the panel, that'll be easier. Yeah, great. Um, uh, welcome, welcome to the session for myself. Um, um, as as you may have noticed, um, Greg Schwarman, who we had to be here, it, unfortunately going to be. But we have a, a wonderful Mason Cooper, who is thankfully stepped in, and yeah, just waved. And okay, yeah, again, okay, again, same sort of stuff. Um, this recording is being this event while it's being recorded, so. From the solely by the owned by going to go to by um, the SMA, but you're welcome at the end of the series to request the videos and recordings back to watch them back. Um, yeah, so unless anyone at all has got any questions, then I think we can begin. Uh, cool. So uh, the way this is going to work is that there's not a particular question for a particular panelist. We're just going to fire out the questions that we we've been given, and then uh, it's a bit of a free for all um, as to whoever answers them. Uh, so first off, we're going to do some introductions. Um, so uh, just if each of you could, we'll start with Harry at first. If you could give us a brief um, introduction about your uh, the area of the industry that you work in, your background, and uh, what you're currently working on. Or most recent. Hi, I'm Harriet. Um, I apologise if my internet goes weird and I freeze. I'll try and do it in an interesting manner. Um, I am lucky enough to be working. I'm currently at Chichester. We're um, still rehearsing our Christmas show. I'm actually here as COVID officer, which is a slight shift for me. Um, most of the time I work as a career ASM and I have done the last 15 years. Uh, during that time, I feel like I've done everything. I've done the odd musical, both to, uh, in touring, not really in the West End, uh, but I love drama, um, regional rep and West End and touring drama is where I've mostly ended up. Um, and these days, mostly out of London. I spend a lot of time on tour and a lot of time uh, down on the South Coast, which is just delightful. Uh, just sorry, I've got my crib notes here about what I'm meant to be telling you. Uh, so yeah. Um, like you, I spent most of the year not doing a whole lot, and I'm lucky to be back here in a very lovely stage management office in the Minerva. At G cool. Thanks, Harriet. Um, Abby, do you want to go next? Hi, um, I'm Abby. Um, I graduated in 2016. It's actually four years today since my graduation ceremony. So, uh, I went to Guildhall. Uh, studied stage management. I spent a year kind of working in London, but not the West End, kind of some of the smaller venues, Hampstead, Regent's Park, and then went on tour in 2017. Uh, and I've been touring ever since with musicals around the UK and Europe. Um, yeah, for like the, for three years, I guess. Well, until we finished, we stopped in March. Uh, the most recent tour I was on was the Book of Mormon. Uh, which was fun. Uh, luckily, we got the European dates done last year before we got into lockdown in March. But um, yeah. Oh, thanks. And uh, Mason. Hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Mason. I too graduated in 2016. So this has been four years since I started my career. I started with internships working towards getting in stage management. I was then offered a full-time position in the stage management team at the Unicorn Theatre in London before I then moved into Derby Theatre for a year and predominantly then stayed around the Midlands, done a couple of tours here and there, um, but I predominantly kind of stayed within the Midlands 
mostly now at the Curve Theatre. I was due to actually go into Still Magnolias at the Rose Theatre Kingston, but unfortunately plans turned otherwise with the with the unprecedented circumstances of this year. Um, but I'm now currently working as a performance leader, recruitment and human resources at a theme park in South End on Sea. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the next question uh, was, how did you train for your career? Unless you've already mentioned. Um, yeah. I didn't. Uh, we'll do the same order. Yeah. <laughs> I trained at Queen Margaret in Edinburgh, which no longer exists, but if you uh, are with or have looked at um, the Royal Conservatoire in Glasgow uh, just after I graduated, the two colleges kind of merged, so quite a lot of teaching techniques and quite a few of the tutors went from Edinburgh to Glasgow and they kind of amalgamated to make drama school. So that, that's my, my background bizarrely was north of the border, despite my accent clearly being the wrong end of that. Um, and yeah, that, it felt like a very long time ago. Uh, four years is definitely not when I graduated. It was 2000. I, I, yeah, I celebrated 15 years since graduation during lockdown. Cool. And you had lots of cake to celebrate as well. <laughs> um, yeah, Abby, guess it. Uh, yeah, so I went to Guildhall. I did a three year degree there. Um, yeah, I learned a lot. It was good. I had a good time there. Um, yeah. Cool, Nathan? Um, so I didn't go to drama school. I actually studied drama at a normal university, Canterbury Christ Church University. And I kind of worked my way through internships before I actually fell into the stage management world. It was all very much by accident. I was actually trained to be a drama teacher and in my first year was offered this internship working as a production assistant on a touring show, working with Oscar Wilde's grandson. And I just heard Oscar Wilde's grandson and went, absolutely, I don't know what the role is, I've never even heard of it, but yeah, fine, I'll absolutely do it, of course I will do it. Um, and ended up working in the rehearsal room and what I didn't realise was they changed my role because I wasn't to be a production assistant, but I then actually became stage manager which was kind of daunting when you're doing your first ever show, professional show, you're still at university, you don't even know what stage management is at this point. Um, but with guidance, I managed to get through it. And then my university actually created a stage management module based from that. And it was opened up to all second year students. So when we started doing it in our university course and yeah, just carried on going into the stage management world. So I'm sorry, I went a little bit off the um, topic there, but. <laughs> That's all right. That's uh, that's going to happen a lot. So, it's just, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, cool. Um, it's a big variety there, like that. Um, uh, next question is: Why did you choose the career of AFM? Have you always wanted to be an AFM? Yes. Oh, I think when I was seventeen, I did one of those online quizzes. This is before Facebook. For those of you who've been around in such a time. Um, but MSN used to do quizzes and you could set them for your friends. And that was my, one of the answers was ASM. I have tried everything else. I have been a company manager. I do still stage manage from time to time. Um, but for me, the ASM role is by far the most interesting and exciting. There is no two days the same. Every job is different. Cool. I think, I think the connection went a little bit then, but I think everybody got the, got the gist. Um, Everyone's nodding, so that's good. Um, uh, cool. Uh, yeah, next. Abby. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, I guess I've always known too. Um, I knew that I wanted to work in theatre when I was relatively young, like, I don't know, 14. I think I also did one of these quizzes they made us do in, like, at school, go and take this quiz online, and um, and it was stage management. Um so I was very fortunate that the college I went to when I was 16 had like a really reasonable theatre department and you could learn about backstage stuff. We, we learned about lighting and design and sound design and um, stage management and things like that. Um, so yeah, I was really lucky. I, I really like being an ASM. Um, being an ASM or an ASM book covers the only jobs that I've done professionally. Like um, I've not, oh, I was DSM for a panto once, that was okay. But um, 
I like I'd like I just like being in the middle of it all I think being in the wings when stuff's going on and being able to respond to stuff and being that point of call kind of what Harriet said for everyone like the actors and the props if if people need to know things they come to you because you've kind of got that overall view of of what's actually happening um then and there so yeah I really enjoy it cool thank you so yes, as I kind of touched upon, I, I actually wasn't intending to be an ASM. I was intending to be a drama teacher, completely fell into it by accident because of that internship. I just fell in love with being an ASM. It was just so, you're on the ground, you're with everyone, everyone's a team. And I like to think the, the stage management team, especially, are the performance going on backstage. You have the performers doing all the stuff that the audience can see, but we are doing the ha the hidden magic that people don't see. And I just, I think it's such something so special and so unique and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, that was it. I'm now a stage manager. That's, that's my, that's my path the rest of my life now. <laughs> I love that phrase, fell into it by accident. I feel like a lot of people relate to that. I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I think that was it for introductions. Um, Bill, have we got any questions coming through? No, not that, not that I've been telling me. Cool, that's fine. Uh, in that case, we'll move on to the to the next bit, which is um, questions about the role of ASM. Yeah, wicked. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, yeah, again, if you if you ever have any questions for specifically for our panel or any at all, then do send them to questions to the panel. So uh, yeah, now now we want to know about the world itself of NASM and um, your experience of it in your career. So my first question is, in your opinion, what are the most important skills to have as a assistant stage manager? Cool, um, Mason, who will start with you? Sorry, is that me you're starting with? Yes, please. Lovely, I, I think one of the key things is remaining calm under pressure and keeping a level head at all times. Backstage can be a very high pressure environment and things do go wrong. It's live theatre, always expect the unexpected kind of principle. If you start going, oh my God, everything's going wrong, that reflects in everyone. That spreads across the cast, it spreads across the dressers, it spreads across everyone. And that's not the environment where things get productive. That's just where things will start to fall apart. You need to keep a level head. You need to take a deep breath and go, okay, problem solving time, let's go. Definitely keep a level head. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think se several times for myself, uh, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've, challenged, I've been challenged to get, get the balance and to have that attitude, if that makes sense. Um, Harriet? Uh, it's obviously similar, but my answer is always appear that you have time. You may not have any, but somebody comes and asks you a question to them. It's really important and you need to give the impression, even if you need to be in 18 other places, that you're not rushed. Sometimes you're going to give them a short answer, which is this scene change is about to happen. I'll be right back. But you are important and I have seen you. And I think empathy is something I use a lot. Um, you are working with of people. Actors are stressed and scared and there's a lot going on, but you're also working with a creative team and it's, you, they're having to rely on you to make their vision a reality. If it looks rubbish on stage, that's sort of because we haven't done our job properly. Sometimes it's because their design is weird, but generally it's because we haven't done our job properly, um, if they're good. And, um, and it's a massive trust to put in somebody to put your vision on stage night after night perfectly and and you need to have empathy and attention to detail so i think those are my three time empathy and attention to detail oh definitely there's, there's some good ones there and um, abby what's your thoughts uh yeah i mean kind of the same as as mason and harriet i think i think your attitude is by far what people will remember you for if if you come across as like a friendly approachable positive person people are going to remember that over you know, whether your spike marks were really neat, because at the end of the day, this is a job that means that you are interacting with like a whole range of people constantly. You can go from, you know, being in a wing with a designer who's been doing this for years and then going to see an actor and this is their first job ever and they're really nervous and they don't know what they're doing and, and being able to kind of jump between 
those interactions and make everyone feel at ease is really, really important. Yeah, awesome. At the end of the day, our industry is, is about being people. You have to be a people person. Um, and judging young people and being social is what it's all about, essentially. Awesome. Uh, my, my next question, um, perhaps more specific to um, some of you than others, is um, what, uh, do you prefer um, cropping for contemporary or period productions? And which is easier? So, if anyone in particular has um, an answer. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll hey, go. Oh, I was going to let Harry go. No, no. I don't mind. I will take anything from before about 1985 and anything after about 2000. Basically, the 90s are a total nightmare. Everybody has thrown away VHSs. Everybody has thrown away Walkmans. Um, everybody has thrown away cigarette packets without the health warning on. The 90s are a total nightmare. Anything before that is fine. It's vintage. It's cool. If it's really old, you can make it up and nobody knows what it looked like. If it's modern, once again, you have a few geeks in the audience, but generally you're fine. The 90s are a nightmare. I've done it, but it's, yeah, that's, that would be my least favourite period to prop. I've got to completely agree on that one. <laughs> the 90s is just a bleeding nightmare. I, I love doing period props. I, I, honestly, period props are so, it's just fascinating researching the history behind them. I love a good antique store. Any excuse to go to an antique store, sign me up, I'm there. But I will say with the antique stuff, it can get very expensive and you've got to know where to look. Charity shops, are gems if you can find a good charity shop especially with the antique stuff they're rare but you can normally find some absolute gems they might need a bit of a clean up might need a good polish but you can find some real gems in there retro weirdly has become very expensive as well kind of like the 1950s 1960s however a little tip for you all ikea ikea at the moment has gone back to a lot of 1950s, 1960s style furniture, especially like their chairs. Um, I did a show recently set in America in the 1960s and managed to buy chairs from Ikea, which I then just upholstered, put some cushions on, and it was perfect. It was exactly what the design was after. It was the exact model box image. So yeah, Ikea weirdly is a very good place to go prop shopping and it's not too expensive. So <laughs> bear that one in mind. Awesome. Um, my next question is pretty linked linked to um, to that, and um, you've touched on it briefly. But um, how would you inquire about um, hiring a prop for my hire house? Um, yeah, Mason, you're on your own. Do you want to carry on? Oh uh, yeah, sure. So I mean, <laughs> it's very good contacting any theatres and seeing what they have in their prop store and asking if you can come and have a look in their prop store. Theatres, especially the producing houses, do have some very good resources. I've worked a lot at the Curve Theatre, and if you've ever been to the Curve, you, you'll have a car park next door, but underneath that car park is a complete prop store full of furniture, glassware, cutlery, just any kind of prop you're after. They have a massive store across the whole of the NCP car park. You can ask them. They normally would like charge you a fee to hire that prop, but it's definitely worth it. Other places like English Touring Opera, they have a catalogue. I know because I made the catalogue for them. Um, and yeah, you can actually request a catalogue of their props that normally have very bad images, but you can kind of gather what condition they're in. Normally when you receive them and they're definitely not the same condition as it looks like in the photo. Um, they're, they're loved, let's put it that way. But yeah, you contact the theatres and National Theatres Prop Store, the RSC have their prop store. They will charge you, but just contact them. And normally, you know, they understand, they know how the industry works. If you've got a small budget and you explain to them, you're a small touring production, you've only got this kind of budget to work with, you need the items as cheap as you possibly can. A lot of the time they'll give you a discount for a thank you in the program. Yeah, to add to that, you're, if you're in a drama school, then you've got a great resource. Right now, obviously, you can use it, but you can use it afterwards as well. Even after I left drama school, 
Mount View um, back when it was in Wood Green. I spent a lot of time carrying a weird object through Morrison's. Um, but <laughs> you may feel like you don't have any contacts, but particularly if you're already, if you're in a drama school, you've already got an entire course worth. Um, your tutors will know people at other theatres, so. If you don't know where to start looking, chatting to them is a great idea. And as you you will walk into theatres, you will spot props. Um, some theatres don't have massive prop stores, but as you go about, just kind of you will start to notice weird and wonderful things. And there will come a show in six months' time where you need a bust wearing a hard hat. And uh, I found that once. That's why it's in my head. Um, and you know that the globe happens to have one sitting on its stage door. So. And I spotted that on a tour. It wasn't even a like a backstage thing. It was a thing I was doing with a mate. Um, so you will start to go, hang on, I've seen one of those. Um, if you've seen it on Downton Abbey, then that's probably BB National Props Hire and that's more expensive, but clock this stuff. Read the programs when you go and see shows. That will tell you where they got a lot of their stuff from. Very good. Um, Abby, what's your experience of um, inquiring props? Um, I haven't I haven't really done a show that I needed to prop for for quite a while um, and the last one I did was uh, at Hampstead Theatre and they they have a pretty big well it's not massive but it's very full prop store um, that they have as well I think like Mason said any of the producing houses and that's not just venues outside of London places in London too do have their own things it tends to be maybe not quite so big because space is a bit more of a premium but there's this whole network of, you know, the old Vic might have it or Hampstead might have it or Regent's Park might have it or just phone around. And especially if you're struggling um, try and try and find out if there were any shows of a similar period that have happened in the last year, because somebody, another ASM six months ago might have bought 17 of this specific type of plate for a show that happened down the road and they're now just sat somewhere. So call someone up be like do you know what happened to them did they go back to stores or has someone else nicked them or are they now sitting in on a shelf somewhere like the the best way I think to kind of um find things you're really struggling with is just to ask as many people as possible like Harriet said you have this massive network of course contacts but also in our industry people are so open to helping each other if I got a random phone call being like where is this prop that you used a year ago I would try my hardest to find out where that prop went oh great um Harriet, I might ask you, um, what, um, when you're contacting a hire house or anywhere, how would you um, inquire about a particular rare or unusual um, prop? Um, if you're going for the, the big hire houses, and I'm aware that quite a few of them like A&M and stuff have shut down recently, but they do exist in the BBC and the RSC and stuff, mm -hmm. is if you're contacting those high-end ones, make sure that you have done your research. These, these guys aren't, I'm afraid, going to go for credits in the program and cheap it's a business that they're running um, so you want to be as clear as you can to be if you're if they're going to have to send you information you don't want them to do your job for you so what you want to be doing is is if you're looking for something very specific then you're you're clearly laying it out you're laying out dates you're laying out which theater company it's for and if possible you're attaching pictures you do not want them like if you go looking for cut glass they have got reams of that kind of stuff like I know Chichester gets sick of the amount of cut glass it's got here um, but the our, our props manager Katie Hennessy is much more likely to send you images if you go I am looking for six identical wine glasses with stems and whatever and you you know looking like this so she's not going to want to send you a thousand different objects so when you're looking for those those kind of complicated items that you're going to have to hire have to pay for um then you want to make it as easy as possible for them don't talk about budget let them quote you uh because they might discount you never know um but it is you you want to make their life really easy you want to show that you've done your research and that you know what you're talking about even if you haven't got a clue mm. Yeah, and if I may add, just add on to that as well, know your terminology, especially when it comes mm -hmm. to period items, know exactly what time era the item is from. If, if, don't say you're looking for a sofa if you're looking for a King Louis V sofa, because there's going to be so many different types of sofas, but a King Louis V sofa is a very particular sofa. And if you've got particular colours, if your designer's only after one thing, there's no point in tracking down a perfect Louis the 15th green sofa if your designer wants it in Charisse. In like purple. Yeah. 
great Richard goes that's certainly what I'm, I'm, I'm being taught now about that being being very specific um cool uh, my next question is uh, um simple is it is it more common for an ASM to be making props or sourcing them that we've been saying about um Abby can you have that um, I think that's that really depends on what kind of what kind of theatre you end up going into um certainly there's been shows that are maybe a little bit more wacky and wonderful maybe slightly lower budget that you need some bizarre food or um, oversized whatever and you have to make things out of card or polystyrene or however you're going to do it um again it, yeah it just massively depends where you end up going into obviously if you're going to go on to longer running shows you need a little things that have a bit more uh, life in them if they're gonna it's when you proper show you need to think about does this prop need to last me two weeks or does this prop need to last me nine months and that massively depends on how you're going to make or source it you know yes you might be able to build a car out of cardboard and paint it and make it look pretty and paper mache but that's not going to last if you take that on tour it's going to get squashed um, so it varies yeah right um yeah um any more thoughts mason yeah, I, I think it, it completely depends on, as Abby said, the type of theatre you're working at. I mean, I've, I've never personally worked with a prop supervisor. It's always been down to the ASMs to source and make the props. And it kind of comes down to what your budget is. If you are going to need to buy something and then jizz it up to look like something else, you're going to have to do that make yourself. Um, and it also depends on, for example, if the item's actually available. For example, I one of the first shows I ever did required a remote control hedgehog, which I looked and you couldn't, there is no remote control hedgehogs. You can't buy a remote control hedgehog. So I had to make one from scratch. And it was simply a case of buying a hedgehog teddy bear, gutting it, sticking a, a remote control car in it, getting some elastic and putting it around the base of the car and making sure you've got enough height on this bear so it doesn't drag across the floor and drives nice and cleanly. I am, um, I'm lucky these days I often work with both supervisors and makers. It's marvellous. I love it deeply because it means I can give them all the stuff. Like that said, um, paper props will almost always be ASMs, even if you're working in a team, a big team. Um, learn to use basic Photoshop and how to edit on Word and what a formal letter looks like. Um, also running props. So any consumables, food, et cetera, they'll, they'll also be your problem. I'm not a massive fan of repairing furniture. Furniture and I don't get on great. I like it when the makers here repair that for me, it's easier. But you still need to know, even if you didn't source them and you didn't make them, you need to know where they came from and you need to kind of understand how they work because I can guarantee that that chair will get broken off. The Abby's talked a lot about being on tour. If you're, I've, I've been somewhere and a prop broke and I needed to know where it came from. So you, even if you're not, the one doing all of the sourcing or all of the making you want to understand the process by which it where it has come from or how it has been made because it is going to be your job to keep it alive and like Abby said nine months on tour that's quite a challenge I think there's a Facebook status that said super glue for things that were never meant to be props <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think um also just to jump in on the end of that um having having really good um really good paperwork and props bibles and if people are making things for you that's great but um so i we went to switzerland with wicked and they have these really specific they're kind of um tall poles with kind of fake spikes on the end and they snap off and when you're in switzerland no one can send you anything you have to be able to know you have to be able to call that that prop maker up and be like how do i fix this what glue is this going to work with how what any suggestions um, so whilst you don't necessarily have to be the person who's always making or sourcing those props to have a really good understanding on how of how to fix them, how to maintain them, how to give them longevity, massively important. And to also jump on that with paper props, have a hard drive of all the paper props you could ever need because it's nothing worse than you've made a paper prop, you saved it somewhere and then four shows down the line, you need that same paper prop again and you cannot find it. Save it on a hard drive. Literally just have one hard drive 
dedicated to paper props because it will come back up again. If you don't need it, someone else will then go, oh, has anyone got this paper prop? Especially money. Paper money can be a right bugger if you lose any of your previous copies because you, especially with the regulations around reprinting money, you have to make sure they're a certain size. You've got to make sure there's certain parts of the money that doesn't, isn't authentic. It needs to have specimen written on it so it can't be used again in an actual shop. So if you've got those remade up, save them, especially with the timeframes as well, because money in between two years, I think it was like the five pound note changed drastically between, I think it was 1980, 1800s, in two years it massively changed so make sure you just save it you have the time periods it will be a godsend i promise you cool it's awesome yeah definitely um consider all those regulations when, when it comes to props cool so in theater we have different obviously have different types of theater whether it be regional or west end or broadway so uh, my question is how does the a role of an asm uh, differ in those different types of um, theatre? I think personally that ASM shifts pretty much as much as our personalities do. You're going to find out which which jobs you like and which you don't. When I first started, I loved small scale. I liked, you know, two weeks rehearsal and then off to the Highlands of Scotland. Now I really enjoy working in large scale with a big team and some budget. Um, and I don't have to go tramping the streets and looking for all of the props myself. I get to be in the rehearsal room learning the show and making learning how the actors work and showing off by moving things around when they don't think I've been listening to what they said. Um, but um, mostly, I think we discussed in a stage management uh, SMA thing not so long ago about the role of the stage manager. One of the things we're trying to encourage the CSMs to do is to lay out what they expect of you at the start of a contract, because actually it is not so much the difference between say regional and West End or musical and drama. Uh, there is I've not done much of it, but they do work differently. Um, it's about the CSM involved. So I know it's terrifying, but actually it is really worth going to the CSM. Um, hopefully this evening will come up with some of the kind of more common jobs, so propping, petty cash. You may or may not be doing production meeting minutes. All of this kind of stuff, just go, what do you expect of me and where do you expect me to be when? And it is much better to feel a bit of a Muppet and ask that question in the first five minutes of day one than to find that they're really annoyed with you at the end of week two. So that sort of help. I feel like I'm breaking up, sorry. Yeah, I, I bet it does. Um, Abby? Um, yeah, so I think kind of all everything, everything Harriet said was great. Um, and also if, if you kind of take into consideration how long these contracts are, so quite often if, if you're going on to a long running show in the West End, you might be signing up for nine months or 12 months, or if you're on a tour for 15 months, 18 months, that, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis is going to be very different if you are an ASM who's working on lots of shows in, the, in that period of time, you know. Um, the rehearsal period for musicals that have, or like cast change or anything like that is four weeks. So you have four weeks and then maybe, maybe a week of tech and then off you go. Whereas you might be doing four weeks of rehearsal to then do eight weeks of shows and then another four weeks of rehearsal, then eight weeks of shows. So it depends really what you like in terms of you as a person, do you like the rehearsal process or do you prefer show running? Do you like maintaining props or do you just wanna get them through a really short run and then send them back again? Um, I think you, obviously, if you're out on tour compared to sat in one place, you, you're you kind of protecting and taking care of your little thing. And it's your responsibility to make sure that every single performance you do is exactly the same. Um, and lots of, challenges come with moving into different buildings, different cities along with that. Um, I think there's pros and cons to both of those kind of staying in one place and moving around, but it, it's really genuinely up to you as the person which one you enjoy. Yeah, great. Um, Mason, what are your thoughts? So I've I've never read I've not worked in the West End. I've always been off West End, off London, like off West End, or I've been in the regional theatres. And for me, like, I've only recently started doing large scale musicals in the last year. My first one was The Colour Purple at The Curve in Leicester. And it was a very harrowing experience. It was a fantastic experience, but I, it was the first time I was ever in the rehearsal room. But I was also still expected to make and source all the props. And it was about trying to find that time balance of being in the rehearsal room, but then also going out and doing all your prop bits as well. 
and it was one of those things it, it got very complicated trying to juggle both of those aspects because you're trying to be present in the room but then also trying to do everything for the room outside so yeah it, it's very you have to try and balance your time you kind of need to have the conversations with the company stage manager and the deputy stage manager and be like when's it best for me to go out do you need me this morning am I okay to go out and do what I need to do and then come back to the afternoon I'll have everything set up for you I might have some things that they can start putting into the rehearsals as well ask the questions don't be afraid to and I mean I know Harry said about it might feel like you're being a muppet to ask those questions but do ask those questions because it's paramount that you know what's expected of you to do your role effectively. And I'm just yeah. kind of on that. Um, we've all said, see how you feel. I'm afraid there is no way of finding out how you feel until you do it. A lot of drama schools, because, you know, depending on where you're laced, they're like, yes, you must head from large scale touring or the West End is when you've made it. You've made it when you find the place that you're happy. Um, and, I, you know, try everything. I've discovered touring musicals with Bill Kenway. I started on Blood Brothers went this is great but 10 months later it was I was done whereas Abby clearly absolutely loves touring with musicals uh, I'm grateful for that because she can have those jobs and I don't have to you know um, but the only way that you find that out is actually by doing it I have found areas of our industry that I have loved I never even thought I'd work in be aware that every time you shift the rules have changed so when I went to Blood Brothers the rules changed I'm my big wet my, my big West End break was War Horse followed by Curious. Um, sorry, the Curious Incident, Dog in the Nighttime, longest West End title ever. And, um, and that was massive. They were two huge shows. They were both incredibly big when I did them. One as a Depp ASM. And Depp's ASM cover was something I had never met from my regional rep background. I got asked in my interview if I, was in, if I was used to being in rehearsals. I was an ASM rep. I was used to covering rehearsals. I was used to setting up rehearsals. I got completely floored by that question. So when you do apply for stuff that is a new genre for you, just do a bit more research so that you kind of have a clue what might be expected of you. Chat to people, talk to the SMA. We, they can get you in touch with people who have been in there. Um, you know, stuff like this is great because the people running students and graduates group can contact people. So yeah be prepared but the only way you're going to find out if you like it is by doing it oh great thanks uh, my last question in this section is again links and that does the role of an asm change for children's theater uh mason do you have any experience of children's theater so my first professional paid my first professional paid job was working at a children's theater i worked at the unicorn theater in london and it was a very unique experience because I did I did two shows in rep. I did The Owl Who Was Afraid of the Dark. And then complete contrast, we did a show called My Mother Medea, which was about the children of Jason and Medea who were murdered by Medea. Completely end, completely different ends of the like, timeline there. But both the shows were not a typical stage audience setup. It was very much... My mother Medea was set in a classroom, so the actors were literally in the middle of the stage, uh, in the middle of the audience. The audience was sitting all around them. They walked around this classroom, whereas the owl who was afraid of the dark was set up like a jungle gym in a play uh, in a playground, and that that was a nightmare. With especially before the show and after the show, because the kids were invited to walk through the space, and you see a jungle gym in a playground of course the kids are going to want to climb all over it and play on it which is obviously not what we want especially when we had like a lit campfire on the set it was it was very fun <laughs> um, but even that's a role for like the ASM I wasn't in blacks I was actually in plain clothes sitting in the audience clearly you could tell that I was a part of the show because you're sitting in, around a load of kids <laughs> on a camp chair in the corner of the room you stand out obviously um but i mean that show it, it working in children's theater is honestly so magical just to see the audience's reactions to things so that was the show that i the gal who was afraid of dark was the remote control hedgehog that i made and every single time i did that cue to drive the hedgehog on stage the amount of oohs and ahs was just incredible and it's just a completely different experience one of the best things I've ever read from a show report came from that show. 
and basically outside of the unicorn they have like a little sensory chill area for the children and there was this toy snake one of the children brought this toy snake into the auditorium with them so the show report had a note on there saying a child brought a snake into the auditorium the amount of follow-up emails coming from designers from the artistic director going why was there a snake in the auditorium was it was just hilarious but children's theatre is very magical. It's a very rewarding experience. I DSM'd a show that Christmas actually called Boing, um, which was a two-handed dance piece about two children who couldn't sleep the night before Christmas. And there's this one section where we go into complete blackout and the dancers had LED lights on all their fingers, their elbows, their head, their toes, their knees, and they did this break dancing sequence. But obviously being in complete dark and having two to six year olds, once again, the kids wanted to run on stage. So I literally had to be there with my finger hovering over that go button to bring all the lights up in case a kid ran on stage so we could stop the show and get the kid off the stage before they got kicked with a roundhouse out, out into the auditorium again. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Um, Abby? Um, yeah, I've only done one one kids show and it was um, open air theatre, but it, and I think the, the biggest difference between that and maybe working on other things was just how uh, everything that they do in, in the rehearsal room, all of the decisions are kind of, are kind of taking kids into consideration. We did Oliver Twist and the director wanted it to be quite dark, quite like Victoriana steampunk. She wanted people smoking on stage, but obviously it's a kid's show. Like there's a, set, there's a certain level that you kind of have to stop at. And um, I think I think it's it's nice because there's a lot more care and attention taken to an, an enjoyment of a piece, not just maybe trying to make something to be kind of wacky or out there. It's, it's at the end of the day, you want some, this, you want these, kids to have a really good time and enjoy the theatre and want to come back and and have it be something that they have good memories of um so there's definitely like a really cohesive um goal for everyone who's making it you're really all aware that you're making this for kids to have a good time at which is really nice yeah definitely um Talia, any thoughts kids theatre other than a, a bit of interactive storytelling at York Theatre Royal and it was it's all what, what the guys have said it, it's you keep it safe you keep it accessible um, but you also get to be a child you get to sit there and go what would I I did once have a stage manager walk into a room and go if you were a family of squirrels what would you take on a picnic serious question guys what would you take on a picnic um, and that with with kids shows and with family shows as well which I've done more of when you're working with children is utterly brilliant because you do get to do all the imagination and stuff you, you can kind of throw all the stuff that Mason and I have talked about with you know history and research and accuracy can go out the window with a kid show and it's just like hey is this fun yeah cool let's use that yeah another thing to add as well is your show time's completely different and you you do like a show at 11 o'clock a show at 2 30 and then you go home you've got your whole evening to yourself which you, you kind of learn as you get in further into the career you kind of lose your social life a little bit especially with like friends you had at university or a drama school you will lose contact with some people but on those on kids shows because you kind of end up with your evenings free you can kind of rekindle some of those relationships that you maybe haven't had time with on other shows. It was, the funny thing was I was downstairs in the claw and it was it was Christmas Eve. I had finished my show at 2.30 as the team upstairs were arriving to start preparing for their first show. And I was kind of like, I've already done two shows. See you all later. Oh, Merry Christmas. I'm off home now. Yeah, we can. I often find my children are the most tough, toughest of critics and just say, mean, say what they mean. Oh yeah, they'll, they'll tell you if they like it or if they don't. They they are not shy about that. I mean, the amount of times where some of the kids will go, "Well, that was pants," and you kind of go, "Say it after the show." Yeah, exactly. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, Charlotte, do we have any new questions? Uh, yes, we've got about three questions uh, come from the chat. So the first one uh, was from Eduardo. Uh, hi everyone. A question: uh, How did you manage to land your first ASM job? Cool. Uh, Mason, do you want to go? So I actually landed my first role through the SMA free list. Um, it was literally the Unicorn Theatre 
had someone drop out last minute. I was a graduate member at the time. I filled out the, the free list. They contacted me and asked me to come in for an interview on Friday. It was over the August bank holiday. I, I called in sick to my muggle job. I, I basically wanted to get to this interview because it was obviously a big opportunity for me. I went to the interview Friday morning. Friday afternoon, they told me I got the job. Saturday, I went into work and went, hi, by the way, I'm quitting in three days. See you all later. And Tuesday, started working at the Unicorn. Nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, go for it. Someone hurry it, go for it. Uh, I filled out a lot of applications. Uh, Stage Jobs Pro, as it was just then, had just launched. Um, the free list did exist, but I was a new graduate. Um, the stage had good job adverts at that point. I came home every night from working in a cafe and filled out job applications and read things and sent them off. I am dyslexic, so I had, I think, 10 proofreaders when I first graduated from uni, so nobody knew how much I was being rejected. Um, I was working, I did some profit share, I did some casual stuff, I you know, was on the books of various things uh, when I graduated from uni, but it took me about six months to get my first job, and it was in January, and it was very similar. I um, went to York, I did the interview, um, it took a bit of time to get back to me, they offered me the job, and I quit my job in a cafe, and I moved from Edinburgh to York in about six days, and suddenly found myself in a new city, in a new theatre, uh, with a lot of stuff in a suitcase and stuff in storage. And that's not the last time that happened in my life. But yeah, it was nothing glamorous. <laughs> I just kept filling out applications and bugging people if they knew of anything. And this was, I think I'm old guys. This was before Twitter and Facebook. It's it's harder for you guys. You've now got to follow Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and people's web pages and the stage and Mandy. And it's just continuous. We had like three places to look and then you could go and have a cup of tea. Cool, Abby, go for it. Um, it's just just persistence, I think. Um, I graduated in the summer and I did loads of kind of freelance event worky type things, like nothing even vaguely interesting. I was like that person at the race who would like hand you a neutral grain bar as you jogged past. But um, I remember cold emailing so many panto companies in the summer, um, literally everyone obviously not this year but every the, there is so many jobs going at Christmas and um I was lucky enough that a friend of mine worked in the office at one of the Pante companies and, and was I emailed him I also emailed Kudos I emailed Family First like everything um and a, a, quite a few people got back in touch and then ended up uh getting offered an ASM for a Panto up here um and then the DSM dropped out and so they, a week before rehearsals, they were like, will you DSM it? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, like, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was my first professional theatre job and that was really hard and, and awful. But yeah, just persistence. I, I can't. And that continued on after that. It was a bit of a jump up at Christmas, but then January comes around and there's nothing, nothing there. But just constantly email everyone, apply for absolutely everything, even even if you don't get it, or even if you don't get an interview, people will remember your name. Like be nice about it and, and don't don't bombard people. But six months later, if your CV is newer, oh, hi, I'm just letting you know, here's a, a more recent copy of my CV if you were interested. Like if, they don't, if they're not interested, they'll delete the email. I, I'm just gonna add on to that. We sort of, we might talk about it a bit later. Cold emails are a pain. Some people will say don't send them, but some don't, in which case send them. Um, I finished Blood Brothers and I had no job. So a mate of mine gave me a list of CSMs in the West End and I cold emailed all of them. And none, one of them, of the 15 I emailed, got back to me. One of them got back to me, offered me a job interview. And that was how I ended up on Curious because Ian, who was the head of stage management at the National at the time, happened to be looking for an ASM that didn't have standard West End experience. They needed somebody with something a little with with more of a rep more of a touring background so there is always a chance that you are about to be the person they're looking for and you never know it was I was very very lucky to land on his desk three weeks before mm -hmm. he needed to do an entire stage turnaround and I, I think I know a lot of people that probably got this letter at some point from Phantom of the Opera <laughs> from a cold email saying thank you very much but no we're not looking for anyone right now I treasure that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I can't believe it's got like like it's written in silver at the top. That's fancy letter. Oh, it's it's embossed. It's yeah, all embossed. Oh. <laughs> and it's got a picture of the mask down there. Mm. Yeah, frame that. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, the second question is: uh, Any tips for printing, reproducing new newspapers from a paper crop store? Uh, topic. Um, I remember the place that we used to use was called Data Repro, and it was somewhere in West yeah. London. The only place I've ever used. If you Same need to here. print full newspapers, Andrew Frost newspapers have got everything. If they haven't, buy it on eBay. Um, if you need like proper like I needed a French one but pretty much Andrew Frost newspapers have everything they will send it to data repro who will print it for you there are different costs for broadsheet and tabloid remember if you're doing anything more than about 10 years old for things like the times they are broadsheet um, black and white color double-sided etc um, there are cheaper newspapers and more expensive newspapers depending on how exciting the news was that week um, I once tried to avoid them in that it was fun um, you can put newsprint through most standard office printers so if you're wanting something that's a bit more modern um, and you can buy and all you need to do is change a masthead or a headline you can just about manage to do that using uh, you can buy newsprint paper you can put it through a standard printer um, and then spray mount uh, will stick it on I have done that more to stick lines in for awkward scenes big speeches and stuff um, it won't hold up to a kind of you know big flourish but if somebody's just sat in a chair reading a, an article and then shows it to somebody else that will hold up in the most post arch theatres. I've got two uh, similar questions on if and book cover uh, so the first one is uh, if you've done if and book cover how did you get into the role and how did you prove you had the skills to do it? Because Abby is probably um, <laughs> go to Abby first. Yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of nine, like I think 100% of the time, if it's an ASM book cover role, that's what it's advertised as. So you know before you even apply whether that's going to be an option for you. Um, I applied for one. I think uh, the, the fact that I'd done the panto, which obviously was an absolute fluke in the first place, but the fact I'd called it was um, probably the only reason that I was even in the running for it. Um, it was Peter Pan. There was kids flying in the air. There was pyro. Um, if you can call a panto, you know, if you if you can call a panto, you, you'll be all right. Um, it wasn't massive by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I think that was, I was very lucky. I was very lucky that I had that under my belt. I was very green when I went for my first ASM book cover. Um, it was a real, it was a, the stage manager took a chance on me um, and that's not going to happen every time. But um, my advice would be to just keep, keep trying for stuff, uh, even if it's small scale, like, a DSM cover somewhere in a fringe theatre is better than no experience whatsoever. Um, and again, it just kind of goes down to that attitude thing. Be upfront, be honest, be like, I'm not massively experienced in this, but I'm willing to learn and I'm, I'm keen to try. Um, yeah. I think I also add on to that. I mean, I've only ever ASM book covered one show and I never really got to properly learn the show because the backstage plots were so busy. It was myself and the company stage manager. I could never do a show watch. It was, it was just too busy to learn the show. So I had to try and do it from archive recordings, which isn't the best thing. It's always better to see it live, but you can do it. But the biggest thing I'd say is if you're on a show and you've got your DSM and they're willing to spend a bit of time with you, especially learning to show call, ask them because a lot of DSMs will happily help you and try and progress you into that role if that's what you would like to do. I worked with um, a brilliant DSM called Lisa Lewis uh, um, on the West Side Story at the Curve. She has been around the circuit. She's done Sunset Boulevard. She's done Greece, West Side Story. And she was more than willing to spend a bit of time to sit down with me with the copy of West Side Story and go, okay, let's go through it and I'll show you exactly what I'm doing here. So always ask for DSM. If you've got a lovely DSM, they will happily spend time with you. Cool, thank you. Uh, the next question is about the same role. Uh, so it was, um, if you're an ASM book cover, how do you support the DSM without overstepping the mark, but uh, not being forgotten about? I suppose that applies to AFM as well, really, rather than just book cover. 
Uh, yeah, so I guess um, when you're a book cover, the most important thing to just kind of remember is that you are covering, you're covering the DSM, that is their gig. Any any changes, anything that happens, everything runs through them. Um, I've only ever done it on tour. So every every time we move venue, the queues change, you know, depending on whether the flies are automated or they're in-house or whether queue lights need to be or how fast things move, um, where different set pieces kind of line up or whatever. Every time we move to a new venue, I'll get a little crib sheet with these things have changed, this has changed, this has changed. And if you ever come across a problem or something you didn't feel was quite right or where everything goes through DSM, you just, you have to, remember where you stand in the hierarchy of your department and you are there you are there to assist and mm -hmm. um, never step on anyone's toes and if you're unsure of things it's always better to kind of just remember that i'm gonna add to that it will not as i just shut up for the first time or leaving surprise anybody that i am asm props i can book cover i do it i take very good care of my dsm it is not not one of my favorite games um but you are asm book cover which means that there is a respect there, but there is also a freedom. You are not expected to put the book together. You're not expected to make changes. You're, you're there to cover in the same way that a depth would cover your plot. Um, and, uh, and to kind of allow, you know, not, not, to, not to pressure you when you're doing your first couple of gigs. To be the DSM, that is not your job. Your job is purely to call the show so that it can continue. Uh, anything to add, Mason? No, no, I think they, they, both of them have covered it. There's nothing else, else to add there. Cool. Uh, one last question before we move on then. Uh, this question, is your, is your mental health taken into consideration uh, in your work? Yes. Actually, generally, if you've got a good stage management team, it is. It doesn't always mean this, but good stage management teams do look after each other. Um, you will learn the producers that do and don't look after their staff, particularly if you're out on the road. Um, it can feel very, very lonely, um, even in you know somewhere like Grimsby. Lord knows what it feels like in Switzerland um, if your producers aren't contacting you. But your mental health is taken into consideration. And one of the things that I'm loving about being a COVID officer is that mental health is actually part of the gig. I'm allowed to be worried about how people are doing. And it's thrilling to me that theatres are putting that in. Um, we've still got a long way to go, but it's great to see, you know, mental health first aid and stuff becoming much more talked about. Uh, and, you know, we're a chatty industry. It's, it, I, personally, I feel it is, but I am aware that not everybody feels that way and not everybody feels safe to talk. So hopefully we are changing things. I, I think it's definitely changing. I mean, I could think of like a, a few gigs early on in my career where I, I didn't feel like I had that support. But now I feel like it's becoming more of an aware thing and people are talking about it. And, you, you know, you can always talk to your company stage manager. They are there to support you. Yep. If you are having any issues, speak to your company stage manager. And if you don't feel like you're getting the support from your company stage manager, then you go next chain up and speak to the producers. Normally your company stage manager will be the first point of call and they will be like, on it they will sort anything out for you they'll put your mind at ease and they're, they're there to help you they're there to support you so talk to your company stage manager yeah yeah i think um just kind of echoing what those guys are saying that if it, it all depends on the team that's around you I'm, I'm sure there's many industries that you could ask that same question and you you it would be the same response it depends who you've got around you um Overall, I completely agree. It's a chatty industry. People want want to help people. Are empathetic. Um, I think the difference is that we tend to have quite stressful jobs on a day to day basis. There's a lot of adrenaline going on, and sometimes you are away from home, and we do work long hours, and we do work unsociable hours. We work we, the weekends and the evenings, and we do lose touch with some of our like civilian friends. Um, and and yeah, I guess what I'm saying is whilst it's not necessarily the greatest environment, if, if that's something that you're struggling with, there's always lots of lots of places to go, um, lots of charities to call and lots of people are becoming more and more um, mental health first aiders. So it's like a, a course that people are trying to go on and make sure that there's at least one person in each company that's got kind of a bit of an awareness on how to talk to people. And just to add on to that point as well, remember everyone on the show is in the same boat as well. You, if you're especially if you're on tour, 
you're all together. You're all going to be going through the same thing. A lot of the time, you're not the only person feeling that way. There's going to be at least another two or three people that feel exactly how you're feeling. So just be there to help each other, pick each other up. After the show, go out for a nice gin and tonic and then relax and enjoy yourselves. Cool. Thank you, guys. Um, I've seen there's another question from Edwardy, but I'm going to, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to uh, come back to that at the end of the next section. Um, uh, so to move on to it, we're, the next section is sort of about personal experience. Um, uh, I'll ask these two in one go. Um, so what's been the, the highest and lowest points, really, of your, of your careers? Um, if you've made any mistakes, did they really matter? How did you resolve them? Cool. Um, Abby, go for it. <laughs> um, I would say that the the like the highest point was was probably getting getting on my first tour. I was really pleased. I didn't expect it, and it was totally out of the blue. And I was really green and a bit surprised that I'd got it. And that was definitely a massive high point. And um, it was great. Um, low point would would probably be like the six months before that I guess it's hard that first year after I graduated was really really difficult I got rejected from so many different jobs I was like I'm never gonna make it in theatre I'd get one gig for four weeks and then nothing for two months and um, you just need to keep pushing through like if you can make it 12 months after you've finished then you're gonna be fine um, and it and it's difficult um, but there's a reason that you decided that you wanted to do this in the first place and uh, just just prepare yourself that it isn't going to be easy, um, but you'll get there. Cool. Uh, uh, Mason, do you want to go next? <laughs> so my highest point was probably the opening uh, the pr opening preview of The Colour Purple. It was my first ever large scale musical. I'd always wanted to get on musicals. That was my my end goal was to get on a musical. I grew up watching, uh, my first ever musical was the new Starlight Express at the Apollo Victoria. It's what set my goal on theatre and I absolutely loved it. But I'd only managed to get on small studio shows and plays. So when I got offered the position on The Colour Purple, I was shocked that I got the role because I didn't think I was going to get it. And I just remember getting to that end song when Tashan sings I'm Here and I just burst into tears in the wings because I was so happy that I finally got on a musical. And it was kind of that moment where I went, I've actually done it. I've actually, I'm now on a musical. This is it. This is where I'm going. The low point um, was probably my first ever panto and probably my only ever panto. I, <laughs> I will never touch panto again. Um, I did um, Peter Pan at the Birmingham Hippodrome. I didn't have a good time. I was still learning things. Um, I, I was offered ASM, but then when we got into um, tech, it turned out that I was doing all the flying by foys stuff. I'd never done flying by foys. I've got dyspraxia, so hand-eye balance coordination is not my best friend. Um, <laughs> and so they gave me a manual board, gave me the performer, put him in the harness, went, you're now going to fly him. And I hadn't done the training and was very much completely out of my depth things did not go right they didn't go well and I got to the point on that show things were just kept not working right I was also having issues with some of the others there was other effects going on but they were always around the same time that I was doing a flying thing and I couldn't do both because I still had performers in the air and I couldn't get over to do the effect and I just got to the point where I felt so low so downbeaten and because I was still fresh in my career I didn't know how to approach that matter I didn't feel like I had the support there and it got to the point by the end of that show I turned around and went that's it I've got one contract left I'm now leaving the industry I will not come back thank god the next show saved me <laughs> um, I did a show at the Bitter Royal Plymouth and the team there I'd worked with them previously they picked me all back up slapped me silly and went no you, you, you can do this you're going to be fine and that's actually the show I got offered um, Colour Purple so it all did work out in my favour in the end but yeah, I, I, it, was, it was a very bad time for me. And I'd say if you're ever in that situation, talk to somebody because that was the biggest mistake that I made. I didn't talk to anyone. I suffered in silence. I, I, I kind of ruined my own reputation a little bit because 
I didn't say to anyone that I was struggling. It was things were going wrong and I was just taking it. I was just going, yep, yeah, that's all me. And where if I'd actually gone, I have dyspraxia, I struggle on a manual board, I'm struggling with this, I'm struggling with that. This is the first ever time I've done a panto of this side. And if you know um, Birmingham Hippodrome, it's Kudos's second largest panto. And so to be my first ever panto was very much out of my depth. And I should have spoken up sooner. Uh, at least you're crying the wings of a happy one. <laughs> yes, yes, that was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> cool, Harriet. Uh, I've I, honestly, because they did send me some of these questions, I've been sitting going the high point of my career. It's a really hard question to like biggest love to another, but. I think for personally, one of the best moments, and this is going to sound phenomenally stagey, I apologize, was standing in the foyer of the National because we didn't get the signal in the rehearsal room um, with Chichester Festival Theatre offering me an interview. I had applied to Chichester every other year since I graduated. There's a routine, you apply, six weeks later, a lovely lady called Marion emails you and says, thanks. It's the equivalent of a phantom letter. Um, and I got into that. Like, it was a tradition. I applied. They rejected me. We all carried on with our life. I got very confused the day they phoned me up and offered me an interview. I got even more confused four weeks later when they phoned me up and offered me a job. Um, and I've been lucky enough to work here on and off for the last seven years, which is, is the high. I love high quality regional rep. And so this, this for me was the biggest success. But that's, that's the thing about success in theatre is it's different for different people. I have also done some stuff, you know, other people, their highlight is, is musicals or um, certain pantos. I'm, I'm also, pan I, I don't do pantos. I've, I've never managed to do a panto. It's been admitted before I'm admitted, admitted again. Um, but there were, there were so many others. Um, if you'd asked me when I was in the industry, that would be a very different answer. Um, I have to warn the guys that are only four years into the industry that the lulls in Korea can come again and not just because of COVID. Um, I, I worked really quite well for about uh, seven or eight years and then somewhere uh, kind of 2010-ish, nine, yeah. Um, I, for some reason, I just got another dip. I had three months with no work, um, ended up in events for a bit and that was pretty low because you are, I was sitting there going, I haven't done anything amazing. My ego really wanted um, me to, and I'm telling grandkids about this in 60 years, I really want something just a little bit more glamorous than uh, I did Talented Mr. Ripley at Northampton. And, um, and so I had these three months of really questioning whether I should still be doing it and getting rejection after rejection. And I went to Plaza and met Ali Wade, in fact, at uh, the SMA stand with a friend. We were having a chat and I was complaining because this was around the credit crunch time and everybody was employing acting ASMs. And I was just really frustrated that they would look for actors, but not for people like me. I could stand on stage with a tea tray and a cap. And um, anyway, something in that conversation, Ali remembered my name and then Charles Evans was chatting to her over a pint at the end of Plaza and went, oh, we, re we really need a dep. And the upshot of that conversation was that I got all from wars. Never, ever underestimate those conversations that you have, even if you're whinging about acting ASMs. Um, so I went from the worst period of my life to my first West End gig. Um, I know it's a really old cliche and that dark is, all, you know, that it's always darkest before the dawn and all that jazz. And I would love to say that happens to everybody, but it doesn't. But I promise you, it, on, it only happens to people who keep trying. If you don't keep trying, it never happens. If you keep trying, it sometimes happens. And I get that it's exhausting. Like that is probably the worst part of the job we've all chosen is that you can't think of anything else to do, but you just tired of the... Uh, of the constant applications and for some people you'll solve that by going to sit on a nice long running West End show and that's a totally brilliant way of doing that as you probably gathered the three of us aren't like that we're all a bit insane I <laughs> have no job security at all uh, next question uh, what's been the most fun or bizarre cue that you've had to do backstage I probably remote control hedgehog <laughs> That was a good cue. That was a fun cue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Harriet, you were going to say. Um, I'm, it's a similar one. Dri driving a Lego train around a low stage for Curious. That was 
that oh and putting a dog in a box i quite liked that cue um that, that's a yeah. cue i've always wanted to do <laughs> honestly that show is a great show for asm so it's just it's insane um i feel like there should be others that i've uh thoroughly enjoyed come back to me i'll see if i can think of anything else i've i've got a, a, a it was a tough cue um, I did Great Expectations at Derby Theatre and we had this big wall at the back of the stage that had five doors built into it and they were all on a pulley system and it, it was basically a case that there was no door handles, they wanted the doors just to magically open and I ended up, second act of um, the whole show, I had a, literally a, a list of cues where it was open doors two, three and four together, release door one, open door five, close door three and end up kind of doing this weird finger dance, trying to get all the doors open and closed whilst pulling them and remembering, actually, no, that door's now going to let go. I've got to get that door down. That door's now open. Okay, that door now needs to close. It was a bit fiddly. <laughs> <laughs> and there was the one show I actually ac accidentally let go of all the doors and all the doors just closed. I think I think the most bizarre one was the only time I was ever in costume on stage. That was the open air one. Um, there was like there was a revolve and it had these three shipping containers kind of stacked on each other. So um, the scenes would like take place in different parts of the different shipping containers. So for some of it, a one particular bit, I had to run on stage dressed like one of the like kids of, of with like a bomber jacket and a backwards cap and like scuttle up this ladder and then do a whole scene change inside the top shipping container and then literally open a trap door throw myself down the ladder slamming it behind me before the revolve completed and everyone could see you um but yeah i could be seen by the audience entering like coming on and off stage so i was in full costume and that was weird and fun was that at regis park open air theater <laughs> and did you have a toilet on one of the containers as well if i rightly <laughs> remember I, I I did it on the town just before that show. Yeah. <laughs> that plan stayed silent. I did once get to throw a lot of stuff at an actor. It was a scene about a writer and you know that bit where they get overwhelmed and they fail to write anything. And if it was a film, it would just be an overflowing waste paper basket. But the, the play was more surreal than that. So all of the crew had to stand in the wings with balled up bits of paper and just throw them at the actor on a queue. It was great. I also threw a cat across the stage on that show. That was good. I, I Damn Yankees, I had a cue during the opening number where I had to run to the fly floor and I had a particular point I had to stand at, at one moment in the music, drop this baseball from the fly floor all the way down to the stage. And we started playing a game of how close could I get to the X on the floor. That, that's always a good fun cue. Another common cue, which you guys probably done as well. Um, a couple of years ago, I toured with a show called Pressure, midway through act two, massive storm, actor goes out on balcony, actor walks back in soaking wet. I'm five foot four, actor was six foot four, kneel at my feet, watering can overhead, actor runs back on again. I have poured a lot of water over a lot of actors. It never gets boring. No, I, I definitely agree with that one. I've done that with great expectations as well after the fight scene in the marsh. Yeah. Depending on whether he'd been good to me that day, depending on whether the water was hot or not. <laughs> nice. Um, cool. Next question. Um, have you worked in, uh, so I say you covered this a little bit of shipping payments, but have you worked in um, interesting or unusual venues as an ASM and how did this affect your responsibilities? Uh, I'd say only only the open air one was probably interesting or unusual um, and then just with that comes all of the responsibilities of rain shows so obviously the weather plays a big part in it um, we had some really hot days we had to have like ice packs um, constantly we had ice pack pockets sewn into costumes so people could have ice packs on them on stage if they're wearing lots of layers throwing ice layers at people when they come off at the interval um, or if it's really rainy um, you know, just being aware that at any moment you could be jumping on stage with a squeegee and a towel trying to dry the stage off until they call it off, um, trying to cover all your props. I remember one day at Regent's Park, we set everything. We knew it was going to rain, but they have to wait until a certain point before they make that call. Um, so we set everything up underneath tarpaulins and then waited. And then it was the time to so like, okay. And then we just unset everything again. Um, it was just being a little bit more on your feet, uh, being really aware of, of how these other factors can also impact your show. 
that season at Regent Park as well was extremely wet. So I, I think we had more rain shows than we did normal shows. I, um, think... I, I, I worked at uh, the Crystal Maze live experience, which was incredible. Um, but obviously, if you know the Crystal Maze, you know you have the industrial zone, you have the future zone, you have the medieval zone, and you have the Aztec zone. Aztec was always boiling hot, and it wasn't designed to be boiling hot. It was just always really hot. And it was mainly because the whole area was filled with sand. And you, you literally go home and you just find sand all over your home because you'd walk home and you'd be like, I've taken my steel toe caps off and I've still got sand everywhere. But the biggest responsibility change on that show was that you only had one performer. Everyone else was audience members, but they were the show. They were the contestants on the show. So on that one, we all had to be first aid trained because if anyone injured themselves, you were the first responder. You were the person that had to give them first aid. Um, you also, with that show, especially Fridays and Saturday nights, you'd always have intoxicated audience members and they're playing physical games. A lot of the time you'd have to kind of be there to defend your maze master who was the performer because sometimes they'd get a bit touchy-feely, they'd get a bit too close. We had codes that we would call, like we called them Sherlock's um, and that was our code basically say, we need someone down here for assistance. I think, was it Moriarty? We, I can't remember. We had, there was another code that we'd call if things escalated even further and we'd have to stop the show. Um, so yeah, working in that environment was a very different experience. But it was also great because at the end of the show, you got to go to the Crystal Dome and the ASM on that show was the controller of the dome. So when they said, will you start the fans, please? All power went over to you because you had the fan control. It was always good fun. Then in between every single round, you'd have to go in with a leaf blower and blow all the tickets back into the gutters so the fans could pick them all back up again. It, the cleanup was a bugger, but it was it was a fun experience. Yeah, I think I, ASMing is so different. And site specific doesn't make a huge difference. I've worked in Little Temple, which is a 500 year old dining hall. Um, where you spend a lot of time making sure that protective plastic has gone down and running mats and persuading the crew maybe not to bounce the flight cases off the walls because the wood panelling is probably worth more than their five year salary and a couple of other exciting things. But then you get to sit and eat in, this is going to go further because of the recording. Um, you get to sit in one of the most glamorous banqueting halls in London with the five guys. Honestly, that never gets boring. <laughs> Cool, nice. Uh, I'm just gonna do two more questions on this section and move on to the next one because uh, it's almost half past seven. Uh, so next question, um, is it better to train, um, uh, I'm gonna reword this, is, have, have you found where you've trained has affected um, like your jobs or in the industry or anything like that, whether you've trained at drama school or university degree or has it not made a difference at all? Um, I would say that I would say that when you are training, that's the first question you ask everyone you meet, where did you train? But once you've been out for a couple of years, people really, really don't don't care. And, and I don't mean to sound that in a make mean that to sound rude, but um, yes, you might bump into people that you studied with at uni, or yes, at some point a pal that you studied with might send you a job interview or call you up and say, Oh, they're looking for someone, I'll get you in. That but that's kind of rare. Um once you're out, you meet people from everywhere anyway, and it's not such a big deal once you know more people, if that makes sense. I think it's got a lot to do with your personality and your circumstances. I grew up in Oxford at the time. There was very little producing theatre and that what there was was staffed by very, very talented professionals who were lovely and showed me around and stuff. But there wasn't a hope of me learning on the job where I was living. Um, so for me, drama school was a great way of getting out, making more contacts, massively improving my confidence. I don't think I would have, I didn't have the self-belief to go out at the age of 18 and do it. Um, equally, I'm dyslexic and didn't have the kind of desire to go and study something else at university. I think there's a lot to be said for having a slightly different background, you know, 
DSMs in particular, I meet so many that did not travel. Um, more and more theatres now are doing internships uh, um, and colleges are training to higher standards. So I, I like, I, I, it depends if it's right for you, then it's great. And it's a great way of confidence and leaving home. And I would say having a normal uni experience, but if yours is anything like mine, then they've got you in 12 hours a day and you get a normal theatre experience instead. Um, don't beat yourself up if you didn't go to drama school. Don't feel that you're being mainstream if you do. I, I, I've i got to, yeah, completely. For so long, I felt not going to a drama school was what was holding me back. And the more I think about it and the more I've progressed in my career, the more I've realised that's just my own internal bias. That's not an industry thing. For so long, I felt that because I didn't train at a drama school, my training meant less than someone who had gone to drama school. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is sometimes you will meet the one like very rarely you will meet one person who goes oh well I trained here but that is so rare um and it doesn't really matter because no matter what you're still doing the same job that they are so I'd say if you didn't train at a drama school so what you can still get the same experiences you can you, you might have to work slightly harder because you won't have that same list of network or contacts but you can make those yourself. And it's a credit to yourself if you go out there and you establish that network. Contact the theatres, ask for shadowing opportunities, ask if you can go in and do a show watch with the DSM. You can, you can gain this experience and gain that network so easily just by talking to people in the industry, just dropping an email and being like, hi, is this a possibility? Can I come in and do an internship with you? Don't let not going to drama school hold you back. I mean, the weirdest experience for me, and this, I, I, I did a job working at Mount View, and I was working with a student, mentoring them, and I suddenly had that realisation one day where I went, I didn't go to a drama school, but I'm now working at a drama school. And that's a very satisfying moment in your career. Nice. I think uh, we're just one more from me. Harriet's sort of touched on it a little bit. Um, uh, have you always been confident in your abilities as an ASM or is this growing throughout your time in the industry? Do I get to carry on then? Yeah. You, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, like there are some stage managers I meet, and this might be a generational thing, but I'm afraid they're mostly male who have more confidence and believe in what they do. I have spoken to, I can't, more, more friends and colleagues than I can count who have told me that they're making it up as they go along. We all, like seriously, these are great because nobody on the show needs to know you're using this. You're just on Facebook. You aren't texting your mate who's on a different show going, how did you do this? Or how have you not, how did you, when do, where, you've toured here. What can I, um, you've been in this venue, you've worked with the CSM or you haven't just here's the thing I'm struggling with or um here's why I don't believe in myself and you do constantly we, we are as analytical about ourselves as actors are and most of you get that um and you sort of go out and you do it anyway and then you get those moments where you are running up the stairs at Warhorse where nobody and they've given you a job or you're standing there at the end of the color purple going I've done it and you have to remember those moments because you will also have the moments you will have shows that you don't enjoy you will have shows that destroy your confidence um, I'm afraid if you don't but I have the other guys have talked about having it too um, and then you just have you have to sit down a little bit and go is this because of the the genre or the job or just the people involved. And so there are bits of the theatre that I'm like, yeah, that's not for me. I'm not particularly musical. Me and opera are never going to spend large amounts of time together. I'm going to enjoy opera from this side. Um, don't let those moments completely destroy you um, because the moments where you it works are so utterly brilliant. And there will also always, I'm afraid, because we are humans, be people who make themselves feel better by making you feel like you've done your job badly and as the ASM you can very much end up at the bottom of a pile of people who have no confidence 
So at times the designer will tell you that you're hopeless because you haven't envisaged the thing that they didn't tell you about. And the DSM will have a go at you because they've just had the lighting designer have a go at them. And eight actors who have stood on stage in front of an upset director will also decide that you're the first person they've seen and they'll yell at you. And none of it is personal. If it continues, then it's personal and then you have a conversation. But you have got to let those moments go. And I say this having learnt it I don't say it going well it's terribly easy guys you'll just let them yell at you and then you wander off perfectly happily whistling into the sunset no I get it doesn't work like that you go and sit under your prop table and mend something because that always makes you feel better um but yes I have you know this is it's a career and you know it's very few people and there are some but very few of us have believed in ourselves completely from day one Cool. Anyone got anything else to add? I think I think Harriet's put that so eloquently. That's yeah, literally everything everything she just said. Um, <laughs> absolutely, you you're at the bottom of the pile a lot of the time, and then it's not easy. And there will be moments on lots of shows that you do where you feel awful, and you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. But but there, yeah, then there are those really good moments that you're like, oh yeah, no, I, I actually do like working in theatre. This is nice. Um, but no no one's ever confident from the get-go and if they are then I think they're lying to themselves and maybe everyone else around them like we're all human and I think we're all the very specific kind of human that we want to do this job like this isn't an easy job nobody picks this because it's easy it's because we love it and we have a good time and we we get a buzz off of it and um it may be, maybe you might feel better at certain points after you've done a couple, but you'll never feel 100%. You'll still walk into rooms and be like, I know nobody in here and I don't know what I'm doing and this feels weird. And that's fine. And your boss is probably feeling that too. And the other ASMs are definitely feeling that. But we all just like to smile and pretend. But that's where the approachable thing comes into it. What we were saying earlier about being friendly, being positive, having a nice attitude. Because if someone's having a really bad day, whether that's an actor or another technician or an ASM or whoever, if they know, oh, well, they're nice. Maybe I can chat to them. I'll just catch them at tea break and we'll have a nice chat about something. Just be there for everyone around you. If you kind of emanate those friendly, nice, approachable vibes, then maybe if everyone does that we might have a nicer time it's not all doom and gloom i promise it's fun too <laughs> yeah no I, I i've got to completely echo what's already been said you have got your finger in so many pies that eventually someone's gonna say something and you will feel low but it's about the emotional intelligence and the emotional management and going okay that's been said it's coming from a place where this person's currently got 20 things going on so that's where that's coming from. Unfortunately, I'm the person they've now just taken that out on. Yes, it hurt a little bit, but right now I'm going to go and do this because not only have they got 20 things going on, I too have also got to carry on doing the other 20 things I've got to do as well. But it's definitely down to the emotional management. I have a theory that if I've not questioned something I've done three times every show, I've clearly missed something. And I am that, I am that ASM who even though they've done the show for four weeks, I will spring out my cue sheet and go, have I actually done everything I was supposed to? Yeah, I've done that. I've done that. I've done that. Yeah, I am right. But I'm still going to check this. <laughs> your track sheet can be your best friend at times. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, over to Bill. Thanks. Um, so a couple of questions from me and then we'll move on. Um, so Eduardo asked a question earlier about we promised we'd ask you, and that was, um, what are the misconceptions and assumptions for an ASM or other roles in theatre? Um, Harriet, can you take this one? I can. Can you just repeat? Because I missed the first syllable. Yeah, of course I can. So what are the misconceptions of roles in theatre? Um, uh, all of them? Uh... That, you know, the, the classic one for ASM is that we make the stage manager's tea. You are not the stage manager's assistant, you are an assistant stage manager. Um, there's, and that applies to everybody. The wardrobe department are not there to do your laundry, although they will wash your blacks. Uh, I think technically they have to, but be nice to them about it because they're your blacks. Um, we, I, I don't think 
many actors hold this opinion anymore, but you will sometimes find it, particularly among your family, if you have one of those nice middle class families where the rest of your cousins are doctors. Um, uh, which is that they don't understand what you do. I have been asked multiple times, when are you going to do real acting? Never, guys, you attempt to act. It's hilarious, but only on a cod. Um, you will, um, pe people make assumptions about, you know, you've all lived through the assumptions people are making about our industry. The last eight months have shown you that people think that we aren't valuable and that we are all sorts of things. You know, uh, I've seen self and, and whingy and we are not, you cannot survive in this industry if you give up. You can't survive if you're not generous and creative and passionate. Um, we are a phenomenally tight industry uh, and we all disagree. It's amazing. I personally think that theatre is the biggest advert for world peace that there is. Everybody in theatre thinks that everybody else is nuts. They don't understand why they're doing what they do. You, you will define ASM wherever you go. And if you move on, you will define DSM and production manager and director. That is what we all get to do. Um, it's an amazing opportunity and we're redefining it. The best way to make sure that you aren't falling into stereo stereotype traps is to do stuff like this, is to chat to people, um, is to read more than one source. It's exactly the same as the news. If you're just reading one very biased blog, then you're probably going to get a bad idea about theatre. But the more you chat, the more you know people, the more you're seeing. There's lots of videos now online. You can find out what it is we do. Um, and some of the stereotypes are quite... There are definitely days where looking like I'm evil is working well for me right now. Awesome. I'm just being laughed at by the other two. That's <laughs> entirely my point no. right now. I completely agree with everything you've just said there, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, theatre is like this massive dysfunctional family, like yeah. every kind of this, I, don't, I wouldn't say love-hate, but like a very strong kind of feelings for each other. And, and But at the end of the day, we all, we all love it. And, and we, there's kind of this common shared purpose of we do this and no one really gets it. And that's OK, because we get it. Um, I definitely the mis biggest misconception is that it's glamorous. It's not, I'm really sorry. Like it's not, you t I tell like members and stuff that I work in the theater, like, oh, how wonderful. And like, oh, you go on tour, you must see so many places. I see the inside of a lot of buildings. That's, <laughs> that's oh, yeah, okay. I can tell you where Starbucks is in every city in the UK. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's hard. Like you, you miss a lot when you're working and you, you know, you might miss weddings or birthdays or parties or, you know stuff at home and that's difficult and we work you know we're expected to work six days a week we work evenings we work weekends and it's not it's not glamorous but it is really fun and it's really rewarding um and i hate to say it but very very occasionally it will be glamorous very occasionally <laughs> you will be in the piano bar at the ivy you will be in a red carpet event in the west end you will be invited to drinks with people you've seen on the telly. It doesn't happen often. I can guarantee it happens in front of the person you've just been explaining that your life is never glamorous to. But that's the fun bit about our job. Once in a very, very long while, you will get those moments that you literally money can't buy. Yeah. And you're normally then running to the shop to buy an outfit for it because <laughs> you just was not prepared for it. <laughs> oh, hadn't awesome. bought a new outfit. And the producer's mother poured a glass of red wine all over me. Um, I, think, I think a lot of the biggest misconceptions, though, does come from people not within the industry. Um, I was recently explaining, because I've just had surgery done on my shoulder, which I'm currently recovering from. I was explaining to my surgeon what it was I do. And he wrote a letter to my GP and basically summarised everything I told him I do. Mason is an actor and dancer. Yeah. <laughs> and was like that is definitely not what I told you but okay <laughs> yeah right um Mason just quickly um earlier you spoke about the SMA and free list could you yes. please explain what it is and how it works so the free list is basically your opportunity to sell yourself to anybody that requests the free list so it's a document that goes out to producing houses producers anyone who's might be putting a show on you basically explain to them what your basic skill set is 
what days you were available and your last three productions. And it's your chance to sell yourself to anyone that requests that document. You give them your email address and your phone number and people will then contact you if they are looking for anybody at that point. So when I got my job working at the Unicorn Theatre, I put on there that I was available for immediate start. They had someone drop out. They needed someone straight away. They saw that I was available on there. They gave me an email. I went in for an interview. Two days later, I was in the show. It's, it's a very good resource. I will do it even if I'm booked up. I will still put myself on that document and I will simply say that I'm available from three months time. And then it, it's a document, it's usually about 22 pages long, has listed every single person. Oh, there you go, it's currently 200 pages long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the moment, I can tell you now, everyone is available. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, it's in date order and it's normally, it's date order of an alphabetical order. Um, I know this month they actually swapped it and they actually went in the opposite way. So they went Z to A to make it fair on everyone that's lower down in the list. Um, but yeah, it just gives you the opportunity to say, I'm available to work. Great, thanks a lot. Cool, so uh, our last session, um, Votes Amps Against Us, is just for advice and tips, really. So if I um, fire some topics um, nicely at you, um, it'd be great to get your opinions on them. Um, so, so our first, our first question is about CVs and interviews. So, when you first get your when you get your very first job, what advice would you give to um, someone um, who, who who needs a hand with their CV or interview? Essentially, um, Abby, can you take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. So, for your CV, I'd say. Uh... Don't put too many words on there. Like if you're applying for theatre jobs, you can just write ASM. You don't need to write what your responsibilities were. Everyone in our industry knows what an ASM does. If you are just starting out, it is fine to put what you did at university on it. Try and make there be a small, very like bullet pointy section somewhere with other stuff that, that you're good at. You know, are you good at Photoshop? Do you have first aid training? Like you don't need to just, it doesn't just, this isn't just a job history. You're, you're selling yourself. This document is supposed to stand out. Um, make sure you've got your contact details on there. I do not think that your date of birth is necessary and um, I do not think a picture is necessary. You can be, make it a little bit quirky, but make it readable. I, I just need to emphasize that when you apply for these jobs, there is a minimum of 20 other CVs that this person is looking at. So if it's gonna to be too difficult to read or too wordy or in a funky papyrus font, that's going in the recycling bin. I'm really sorry. Um, tweak it, keep tweaking it mess with the layout make it look pretty um but just try and be as concise and communicative as possible a good acronym for that remember to kiss your cv keep it simple stupid it's the best i mean I, i've seen i've seen one cv from a stage manager and they, they've been in the industry for over 20 years they listed every single show that they have done in 20 years uh -huh slightly overkill you don't need to tell everyone what you were doing in um, 1995 people people don't need to know that they just want to know kind of your recent employments I would say <laughs> no more than two pages because it, it can be a bit too much it's also the point where you can sell your personality so um, Abby mentioned about make it a bit quirky my CV, I have a brand. I have a logo that I use. I have a banner that I use. I've designed it on Photoshop and it stands out. People will see my CV. And I, I've had a couple of people, tends to be older directors that have looked at my CV and they've gone, oh, but then younger people have looked at it and gone, oh, that really stands out. And people remember my CV. So don't be afraid to add a logo on there. Make it a little bit quirky. Add a bit of colour in there if you'd like to. I'd say with colour, don't go like rainbow all over because you, you don't want it to stand up too much because people kind of go, ooh. But, you know, you can make it a bit quirky. Add a bit of your personality onto the CV. I'm going to, yeah, go with keep it to one page. If you have to double side it, do. I've, let's say I'm 15 years in and mine is one page and there's only ever been one page. I used the phrase, which was a hint from the SMA many years ago, employment highlights 
So I alter my CV for every job. If I'm going for a musical, I put all three musicals I've done on there, front and center, nice and big. Um, you know, if I need to prop, if I'm doing touring, you, you put the shows in that prove you've done those skills. You put references on them, um, mostly just for show, I'm afraid. Uh, useful when you a while, everybody's going to reach your CV and phone the people they know. The other thing that people do, and I'm afraid this is very cruel, but it happens, is your CV will go around offices. So once they've made it through HR, particularly something long running, a pile of CVs will turn up in the stage management office and we are a nosy bunch. That is why we're good at our jobs. But we do nosy at other people's CVs. And I'm afraid we're not always entirely kind if you have gone for the um, nice photo and the we're, we're a bit, yeah. You, you, you want to stand out to look good to a team, not to have us all go, really? Scottish country dancing three years in a row. Uh, if it's on there, great, but maybe find a way of making it relevant to the stage management. Um, I did once have a part of a team had a lot of fun with a five page CV that started with a full, a full color photo at the start, which was lovely. It would have been great in spotlight, but it was unfortunately not the right vibe. And if you are sent and CVs we talked earlier about cold um, drops so you know just emailing people out of the blue please find out their name it's not hard you can find a stage door address and you can often find out the name of the person on the show um, make it like we said with props research make it as accessible as you can if you are doing that your cover letter is short because you are wanting to get their attention and not take up their time if you're doing a job application, it's sort of more CV letter, then look at the application, follow the points that they've asked for in the order that they've asked for them, because there is a high chance that before you get anywhere near somebody who can read and understand it, you have to get past HR. So you need to include the buzzwords that they have put in their job application that tells you what they want to know. Um, I did that recently for a mate. And I don't know if she got the job or not, but she got the interview because we literally went through the job app and made sure that it was like, we, we use the same phraseology because we had to first of all get past HR um, and still try and keep it to a page. If you can guys, um, you're all stage managers. We can just about manage reading a script, but after that, we aren't big fans of spending large amounts of time reading it. Keep it short, keep it simple. Don't take up their time. Make it obvious that you are there to make their life better, not drag it out. And include unique selling points that are like necessary for the role. Um, but also don't use, like, if it's a really terminology based thing, make it, keep it simple. So for example, I do vinyl cutting. So I, I've, I have a machine where if you see like the window transfers in shop mm -hmm. windows, I can make those. I have a machine that I can make those on. I use the cricket name and the amount of people that go, he has a cricket. What's a cricket? It, that's an animal. Just, I've learned that mistake. I've now just caught, I say, I can do display window vinyl cutting. And I actually did get a job because a part of the set was requiring vinyl cutting. And I actually got that job because I had the skill set to do it. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. So hopefully it makes sense. Um, so what's the difference between propping for a large scale production versus a small scale production? And also how do you generally maintain a prop? Cool, uh, Mason, can we start with you? So the difference between a large scale production and a low scale production is the stress of the budget. <laughs> Trying to find everything you need for nothing. Um, and normally designers for some odd reason have this very weird conception of what a budget is and a lot of the time will ask you for the most extravagant things even though you don't have the budget for it um i was asked to get i'll go back to the king louis um the 15th sofa i was asked to get one for the show and i mean our budget actually was quite a healthy budget on this show but getting that sofa you know they're normally about three thousand pounds that was the entire props budget it, it can be stressful. You've got to be resourceful and you need to know where to look. And if you find the perfect thing. So for example, I did find a sofa that was a King Louis the 15th sofa. I found it on eBay. It was going to end within an hour. 
I literally did everything I could to get a hold of the designer. I called him. I called the theatre he was working at. I tried every means of direct contact with the designer to try and get this sofa because it was £300. Unfortunately, the designer didn't answer his phone, so I lost it, <laughs> um, which is oh, typical. Boy. But it's, it's definitely stressful trying to keep to a budget and you need to sometimes have the awkward conversation when it comes to budget. And if they are asking for items that you can't afford, there needs to be a compromise and you need to work together and say, okay, if I get this item for you, we will need to cut a cost on this item. Is there anything else you can think of as an alternative? Here's what I've already found. And that is a key thing. Always give them another option. Don't just say, we need another option. Do the homework, do the research, have those options ready to go so you can then go, here are three that I've already found. What do you think about these? Um, it tends, I don't know yet, um, Harriet and Abby might have a different opinion on this one. I have found on larger scale productions, they normally, you normally have a prop supervisor or a prop maker on the books. A lot of the time they already have their own store. So a lot of the time on larger scale productions, they will just pull things out of their own store to hire to the show, um, which is very helpful. A lot of times they will just pull things out and go, this is what I've got. Do you reckon it will work? What kind of amendments do I need to do to this item? Cool, thanks. Um, Abby, do you have any more thoughts on that? Um, more just, yeah, if, if it's a large scale production on you'll have a prop supervisor who um, you'll be in contact with as an ASM, you are kind of the, the point of contact, you're the one who'll feed in those notes to be like, oh, well, the designer, the director said that this tire is too tall, it needs to be shorter. And this is the wrong kind of period fly swat. And like, you'll have these little meetings, you'll have a WhatsApp group with them. It will be you that the prop supervisor says, oh, we're, we're dropping off a load of stuff today. Let me know what works. What shape basket do they like? Um, because you know, your DSM and your stage manager, they're busy and, it, and as an ASM, you, you might not be sourcing the props, but you are responsible for kind of helping integrate them into the room um, and you're going to be the one who's taking care of them. So it is still your job, even though there is a prop supervisor to really be on top of all of that. Yes, you do need to grab the director at lunchtime and say, here's three options of a kettle, please pick one. Then you can go back to your prop supervisor and say, they like the blue one. There you go. Great, awesome. Yeah. The thing to point out about large scale productions is that that they've given you money for a reason. Don't if you're moving from one to the other, it's very easy to take a lot of your like tricks that you've learned um, to make sort of a reasonable prop look good on a cross arch, and they want a higher quality prop. Um, Chichester was a massive eye opener for me. If you've never been here, it's in thrust and the Minerva particularly is a 300 seater where the front row is on the stage on three sides. They can read the book spines. You cannot get away with anything in this venue. You are given a budget because it has to look perfect. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you, it's, you, you do have to have done your research and know what you're talking about, but equally you don't put forward uh, sort of cheap imitation stuff. if it really looks cheap. You put forward the thing that looks right. Now, sometimes that's cheap, which is great. Um, but it means you do have to, uh, attention to detail, like we said, research and attention to detail when it comes to your props. And maintenance is a, how long is a piece of string question, I'm afraid. You will discover a lot about glue. Learn that. Um, Marcus Hall Props, who are a big supervisor in London, we love them. Uh, once gave me an entire lecture on YooHoo. I kid you not, guys, it's going to come exciting. Um, learn, learn what glues do what. It's, it will make your packing easier. Take that with you. Learn basic sewing. Also, we've all got different skills. When you're propping a small show and managing a big one, I know the stuff I'm happy with. I'm great with paper and fabric. I am less good with woodwork. So you pull the favors from the crew or other members of stage management. Your CSM often loves a prop, but learn where you need to pull the favors. I, I have to pull the favors when I want a piece of furniture mended. I can do it, but I'm not brilliant compared to the guys around me. However, my calligraphy is not bad. So you want to improve your skills. You want to develop. And there's also times when you're fixing stuff, when you have to think about resources, not just to do with yourself, but to do with other people, to do with time to do with money, always fix the thing that you find hardest first because 
you know you can scramble the stuff you find easy at the end um, and um, and love your props. I talk to mine, that's no secret. Uh, you, you have a relationship with them because your job is to get the props and the actors working well and the actors really do have minds of their own. So if you make the props behave, then you're 50% of the way there to the evening going relatively smoothly. I'm, I'm glad you talked to your props because I <laughs> named my props. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the note about glue, Hobbycraft have a wonderful PDF that explains to you every single type of glue and what you use that glue for. Go download it. I have it printed and laminated in my kit. And I carry it everywhere I go because if I need to know what type of glue I need, I am on that document and it will tell me exactly what glue I'm using. Same with paint, fabric, all those kind of repairy things. You can find this information and it is well worth anything else. You, look, you can look wonderfully efficient and smug, which is just fun. A laminate is your best friend as well. Yeah. That kind of information, oh. print it and laminate it because you will always need it. Oh, great. Um, since, since it's relevant, um, Misha's just asked, do you know the exact name of that document or where to find it? Uh, bear with me. I think I have it saved somewhere on my desktop, so I will have a look and I will get back to you. Okay, we'll do. Cool. Um, move, quickly moving on then. Um, so we've, we've gathered that in the volume of SM or in theatre, you have to be a people person and communicate a lot, but that doesn't always go to plan. So there may be conflicts and disagreements and stuff like that, as, as ever. So how do you tackle those situations in the backstage? Um, Harriet? Case by case. If you've put, if you're lucky, this happens when you already know people. Um, as an ASM in sort of small to medium, you may well not have been in rehearsals and tech can therefore be quite tricky because you're not only trying to learn a show that you've maybe watched one run through for, but you're also trying to learn, teach the cast that they can trust you. Um, so that can be your most kind of vulnerable time because they don't yet know you and they are, as I said, they're scared and stressed. And mostly I find conflict happens in theatre because people, when they're scared and stressed, kind of step back and resort to, to um, defensive action. We've seen it a lot over the last eight months just with COVID, you know, people yelling in supermarkets and things. Um, you know you have to play it by ear uh placating is i'm afraid generally where you're going to you need them to calm down your aim always is to keep the show moving whether that's to keep tech going uh if they get violent that's not fair on you you are allowed to walk away from that depending on whether how much they're yelling at you um and you have to trust that you know what you're doing. You have to trust that you know your show. You have to trust that you know the people you're working with um, and that you're not alone. You're, if you're in tech or on a show, they're a headset most of the time. If you're in a rehearsal room, you're very obvious. You, if, you should be able to attract somebody else's attention, even if it's just a case of clicking hear the actor who is yelling at you or hear the actors that are yelling at themselves because actually that's harder when two people are rowing and I have witnessed in a designer have a full scale row in an auditorium in front of an entire company. Um, there was very little we could do about that. They just had to shout each other out and then we had a tea break uh, because that's what you do. Uh, but I don't think there is an obvious answer ever to conflict. I think if you try putting a formula to it, I think if you try having a very definite way of working with every single conflict, you'll just create other. You, you have to trust you're a people person, you know your venue, you know your company, and to, to try and make the right decisions. And you won't always, and you'll go home and you'll feel bad. Um, you shouldn't, but you will, because you want everybody to be happy and safe. And then you will learn to live with it and get over it. And you'll learn from it. Um, you probably learn more from mistakes and conflict. Um, so I think I think uh, it's eight o'clock now. So we're probably going to um, leave it there. Uh, but I just have a few things to mention before everybody uh, disappears. Um, so uh, all the hot topics in this session have been noted. In our, and um, there's a on the Friends of FMA page, there's a hashtag, Ask the Team. Um, where uh, Martin, lovely Martin, in um, questions to the panel, will put um, 
put any of the questions to to the friends at FNA group. Um, so like anything you feel like we have, he's waving. <laughs> anything you feel like we haven't finished talking about, um, that can go on there. So feel free to send those to Martin. Um, uh, second in the series is next week, chance, chance to ask a producer. That will take place next Wednesday, the 11th, uh, from 5 till 7, a bit earlier than this week. Um, this will be hosted by Coral Nelson and Misha, Ma, and the panelists will be Richard Darborn, Clive Shellery, and Joanne Benjamin. Um, in the meantime, you can come along to the Friday sessions, um, the student and graduate dropping sessions there every Friday at 1 o'clock. Um, we just have a little chat, like like the tea breaks and stuff like that that have also been going on, just sort of chatting about different topics that Martin has a big list of. Um, so yeah, and um, if you want any of the recordings from any of these sessions, then um, as Bill mentioned before, at the end of the series, you can contact Martin for those. Um, I'm just going to send a link as well to uh, the events section on Stage Management uh, Facebook page. Stage Management Association, um, that'll have all the events on there that I just mentioned. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for coming. For myself, all that's left to say for me is thanks an awful lot to um, Mason, Harriet and Abby for um, helping us out and um, in lending their expertise in a way. Um, yeah, and obviously thanks a lot to Martin, the mastermind behind this whole series of events and tonight and Ali Wade for spreading the word and also being a big part of putting, putting out, making it happen. Um, thanks to you guys, obviously, for attending because inevitably a winter have happened and we, we hope you enjoyed the session and got a lot out of it. Well, one last thing, um, Martin wants to do a screenshot for publicity of everybody smiling and looking happy and, and um, yeah, so everybody turn your cameras on and we'll do a quick screenshot. Or leave quickly before they notice. <laughs> <laughs> you can't oh, yeah. leave. <laughs> they will notice. <laughs> cool, let us Bye, know everybody. when. Cool. Great. Uh, thanks guys for coming. Hope to see some of you next time. <laughs> awesome, thanks guys.